Science and Human Origins, Objections, Part 5. We've been going over the um, book Science and Human Origins uh, by the, uh, Ann Gager, Douglas Axe, and Casey Luskin. And uh, for those of you who are viewing, have viewed previous episodes, I now have the pronunciation of Gager correctly. Uh, <clears throat> there are five chapters, we've gone over them, and we've gone over objections to the first four, and today we're going to be concentrating particularly on the science of Adam and Eve by Ann Gager. The book is available online. The book has been reviewed by Paul McBride of Auckland University in New Zealand. And uh, uh, the review has been recommended by others. Um, the objections to chapter one can be found at the website listed, and objections to two, objections to chapter three, objections to chapter four, which we covered last week, and now objections to chapter five, which is what we'll be covering this week. Um, I got this critique from uh, uh, a uh, blog that Jeffrey Sonnenberg, a uh, Sonnentag, I'm sorry, I don't get that right, um, uh, made with uh, in uh, clubadventist.com. And uh, somebody by the name of Igakse um, commented and uh, gave a couple of uh, places to look, and we've been particularly looking at uh, the science and human origins thing. Uh, you'll notice that this is actual evolutionary biologists. Um, I didn't pick out that critique myself. If it was cherry-picked, it was uh, cherry-picked by Igaxi. The comments in the book at Rational Wiki also recommend this. As you can see, is an anti-science book has received negative reviews from scientists for pushing a religious agenda. The sole purpose of the book was an attempt to try and prove Adam and Eve existed. So they think that chapter five is the main rationale for the book. Um, the book has been debunked chapter by chapter in a lengthy online review by Auckland University of Technology PhD candidate Paul McBride. Now, notice he's a PhD candidate, which is okay. Um, that really has very little to do with formal training. Uh, that, uh, the, the comment that I'd made is, you know, next time somebody says, well, so-and-so doesn't have his PhD in the field, it doesn't mean too much. Obviously, they're quite happy with having PhD candidates. Or other people commenting on the field, the main thing they want is that it gives the right data or the right comments. And of course, the right comments depend on which side you're on. So it's a viewpoint discrimination, almost pure and simple. Well, it's not quite pure and simple because it's nice to have somebody who actually understands what the comments are, uh, or what the problems with various views are, what the data behind them are. And so uh, a PhD is one way of trying to assure that. It doesn't always do it uh, either positively or negatively, but uh, it is one hurdle that suggests you might know a little bit more. Uh, but when you hear arguments like that, remember what they're really arguing is the guy doesn't know what he's talking about, not that he doesn't have proper credentials. Chapter 5, Objections. Um, uh, uh, this will be, again, partly Reader's Digest treatment, although this is good enough that most of the time we'll be quoting McBride in full. Although it concludes the book, and Gager's The Science of Adam and Eve in Science and Human Origins was the first chapter I had seen. Excerpts have been posted suggesting the book made an argument for a population bottleneck that would allow for a real-world literal Adam and Eve. Well, actually, they, it, that isn't quite true. 
But it's understandable that somebody would read it that way. The idea intrigued me for a couple reasons. How could intelligent design remain secular? See, they're, they're convinced that really it's not secular. Really it's just Christians undercover. How can intelligent design remain secular when its leading institution is publishing about a literal Adam and Eve? Will common descent be acceptable and the argument be instead that we were imbued with humanness at this bottleneck? He's looking for a theory. How will the evidence of our long-term effective population size be treated? This was the genesis for the multi-part review that concludes here. And um, then he has a paragraph which finishes everything has been building up to this. Um, basically, uh, arguing that, that this is the only new stuff that's in there. Well, it's not, of course. Chapter 1 and 2 have that new stuff that is absolutely devastating, in my opinion, uh, that says that the secular literature now admits that the probability of humans having two consecutive neutral mutations that somehow become uh, a new beneficial mutation are uh, vastly less than one in the entire lifetime of the human population as it's commonly understood. Um, as a matter of fact, in the primate population as it's commonly understood. Um, and so everything really hasn't been building up to this. This is just a kind of little icing on the cake. At least that's the way I read it. And Gager is not arguing that this is the way it happened. She is simply arguing that the science doesn't stand in the way of it, which is a little bit different. To convince us of the possibility of a literal Adam and Eve, and that's fair, it is the possibility, it's not a proof of Adam and Eve. And Gager presents, uh, presents to us doubt over whether a single published paper from the 1990s truly supports a large human population since speciation. In this paper, Francisco Ayala had used the ancient polymorphisms in a 270 base pair sequence of immune system DNA, exon 2 of HLA-DRB1, to suggest that we must have had a population far greater than two for the whole time since our lineage and the chimpanzee lineage separated. Because he found more than four alleles, versions of exon 2, that predated the splitting of the human and chimpanzee lineages, there could not have been a human population bottleneck of two people. In fact, Ayala's calculation supported a human population size of 100,000. Well, that's He found way more than four alleles. He found 32, if I remember the uh, review correctly. And uh, the argument that it took 100,000 to, to keep that alive naturally, of course, was a, a reasonable uh, deduction from those 32. However, there is incongruence between the phylogenetic trees built from exon 2 that had been built up from its surrounding introns. And by the way, the reason for picking on this one is because A, it was the first, B, it's the one that's most rubbed in creationist noses. You know, here, this paper, what do you do about this? Um, because Recombination appears to be limited in the genomic region where HLA-DRB1 um, is found. Gager argued that factors other than ancestral polymorphism might account for the exon 2 diversity. This limited recombination means that there are recognizable major haplotypes of HLA-DR, and Gager argues that we should base our estimates of the number of ancient polymorphisms on these. Because these haplotypes contain long introns, molecular dating for them is also more reliable than dating is on exon 2. And so far he's stating fairly concisely what's going on. What Gager then argues is that there are five major haplotypes, but only three of the haplotypes are what she calls ancient. 
Because up to four haplotypes could be inherited from two people, the existence of only three leaves the door open for an Adam and Eve bottleneck. Um, or from a creationist point of view, leaves the door open for an Adam and Eve creation. Unfortunately for Gage here, even if we accept all parts of our argument up to here, we are forced to conclude that this final step is wrong if the book is to be internally consistent. The other two major haplotypes might not be ancient, but they are still four to six million years old. Gage agrees with this. While this does, not, while this does mean they originated in the hominoids, Gager takes this as evidence that they could have come from Adam and Eve. Why is this wrong? Well, if we recall Luskin's chapter, he argued that Homo habilis was seriously non-human. No self-contemplation for the Habilines. Yet Homo habilis originated about 2.3 million years ago, and Homo erectus did not arrive until 1.8 million years ago, marking what Luskin accepts to be the start of humanness. That is, of course, if you accept the... Uh, standard geologic time scale is being accurate. Back at four million years ago, when the last of the HLA-DR haplotypes originated, our closest relatives were Australopithecus, Australopithecus. Anatomically modern humans were a long way away. So we can be sure that the five major haplotypes of HLA-DR all predate the genus Homo and contradict the claim made by Goucher, uh, Ge Ge Gager, I'll get it right one of these days, that the argument from population genetics has been that there is too much genetic diversity to pass through a bottleneck of two individuals as would be the case for Adam and Eve. But that turns out not to be true. Instead, the argument from population genetics still definitively rules out the possibility of Adam and Eve, even if Adam and Eve were human. Or if Adam and Eve were human. Now, um, before I go on, I will just uh, point out that there are two possibilities if you accept the standard geologic t uh, time scale that, uh, that he's ignoring. Number one is that anatomically normal, uh, modern humans may extend backwards farther than uh, uh, two point uh, three million years, may extend even further back than that. Uh, the Aleatoli footprints are anatomically modern human. Uh, they do not match at least one of the Australopithecine feet that we found, um, which looks more like a chimpanzee foot with the, toe wide, uh, the great toe widely separated from the other toes. Uh, you look at the uh, footprints, and then you look at the skeletons of modern humans, of, uh, say, chimpanzees, and of Australopithecines, and I think the point is obvious. So it's very possible that anatomically modern humans predate the Australopithecines, and therefore uh, humans could have originated sometime before Australopithecines were around. The other possibility, again, assuming the standard geologic time scale is that the estimate of four million years is off. Those estimates tend to be, first of all, they have a fairly wide standard deviation. It could be 2.3 million years instead of, uh, 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 or it could be, uh, yeah, 2.3 million years or perhaps 1.8 million years instead of four. There's a standard deviation there, which it's interesting that he didn't even attempt to give and uh, you know, the argument assumes that it's exactly correct. Um, the other thing is that uh, that estimate may, again, uh, be off as we'll see again, and, and Gager will mention this as a, as a possibility, that uh, four million years may not be, even from the standard uh, methodology, the best estimate. That what you may be looking at is something more like 100 and, uh, 30 to uh, 400,000 years, which ironically is just about the range that um, uh, mitochondrial Eve and uh, Y chromosome Adam are supposed to have been. 
And what's happened to those is even more fascinating, and that is that when you don't use standard time scale based measures for, uh, let's say, mitochondrial uh, DNA development, you find out that Y chromosome Eve actually shrinks down to about 6,500 years, again, plus or minus, uh, which sounds remarkably like uh, the biblical time frame. And uh, nobody's redone those kinds of calculations using known modern DNA. And it's very possible that, that uh, mutations happen much faster than what uh, is standardly believed in the uh, evolutionary community. In which case, maybe all of these things point to an extremely short time frame. Somebody should go back and redo those calculations uh, using modern estimates for DNA change and see what uh, kind of data you get. So although this sounds pretty impressive uh, to start with, I think that when you start asking questions about it, uh, the argument tends to fall apart. But moving on, so far I've only mentioned the one line of evidence around ancestral human population sizes as discussed in Gage's chapter. But there are many more reasons to argue against a human two-person bottleneck. Unfortunately, Gager does not engage with any of the modern literature that provides evidence of reasonably large human populations over our evolutionary history, instead only taking on Ayala's single locus argument from the 1990s. So what he really wanted is, instead of a little tiny paperback that everybody can read, he wanted something that was thick enough that nobody would bother reading it which maybe there's a place for that kind of thing later on. I will discuss just one, a compelling modern ex examination of our ancestral population size. When I first heard about this book, my immediate thought was, uh, what about Lee and Durbin, uh, 2011? Readers of Gage's chapter might not know this paper because she certainly doesn't discuss it. Lee and Durbin, however, trace effective population sizes evolutionary relevant estimates of the adult breeding population size over our evolutionary history as a species using comparisons of entire genomes from across a range of ethnic groups. Well, that's um, probably a little uh, expansive there. I don't think it's, I think it's selected areas from entire genomes from across a range of ethnic groups, but uh, whatever. At no point is there anything approaching an Adam and Eve population bottleneck at any point that correlates to the genus Homo. Again, when an earlier chapter has drawn the human-non-human -human distinction between Homo habilis and Homo erectus, i.e. approximately two million years ago, uh, again, take that with a grain of salt, we can be quite well assured that a literal Adam and Eve are unsupported by population genetics. The figure below from Lee and Durbin suggests an effective population size of about 15,000 at the origin of Homo erectus. Now notice what it says there, and we're going to see a figure in just a bit, I think. Yes, we are. Okay. This is the years ago. So this is 10,000. This is 100,000. This is a million. It's a log scale. Um, and, of course, they're saying that 100,000 would be here, a million would be here, 1.8 million would be up here. And so they're saying there's quite a bit of diversity at that point. But as you can see, there are bottlenecks here and here that are quite a bit smaller than that. And uh, and here, the, uh, the population size is, let's see, uh, about a thousand individuals for these, all of them, but these two. And even here, we're talking about three or four thousand, uh, maybe five thousand, somewhere in there. Uh, so, 
you know, the probability of a bottleneck is actually greater here than it is out here. Which is an odd result if you think about it. Dr. Gager has responded to that paper, and we're going to see a little bit of that response later, but in the meantime, I'm going to move on to finishing the objections. In a, se in a section called Take Home Message, the second last of the book, Gager shifts to suggest that perhaps we began from two intelligently designed first parents, and that if this were the case, all of this analysis of how many ancient haplotypes we share with chimps doesn't really matter. And of course, she's right about that. What evidence does she provide for this possibility? She argues, there certainly are surprising patterns of genetic variation within HLA DRB1 that suggest unknown processes may be operating. Let me propose that a process exists which generates specific hypervariability within exon 2 and suppresses recombination elsewhere. The process is targeted to generate diversity precisely in the peptide binding domain. I suggest that intelligent design had to be involved at the beginning in order to rapidly generate HLA diversity after the foundation of our new species, assuming we came from two first parents. In other words, this was designed to diversify. Evidence supporting this idea comes from the fact that HLA DRV1 diversity has in fact e increased very rapidly by anyone's count, going from a handful of variants to over 600 alleles in 6 million years or less, which is a lot. And of course, it may be less than 6 million years. Also, the HLA DRV1 variable regions in exon 2 show a patchwork cross species relationship to their surrounding DNA sequences. That was the stuff that you saw that. Uh, to where chimps uh, and rhesus monkeys had similar sets to humans. Making their origin hard to account for by common descent. And I think she has a point. Their repeated use of similar motifs from different species may instead in indicate common design. I further suggest that this process may be human-specific, since other primates don't show nearly the same degree of allelic diversity within lineages as humans do. Reasonable. That is verbatim the argument for intelligent design that the book has been building towards. I think that's an exaggeration. No. I think that the chapter may be building towards that, but the book, no, I don't think so. The second exon in a gene in the major histocompatibility complex is highly variable and the diversity is human, in humans is higher than other primates. Gager does not consider overdominant selection for immune system diversity in the rapidly expanding human population as it spreads from Africa across the world, which would seem to account for differences between human and other primate diversity at this locus. Well, Actually, as I pointed out, this is not the argument that the book has been building towards. It's simply a finishing touch on the really core argument, which is you can't get there from here uh, with random variation and natural selection because the process simply can't select well enough. Gager also specifically considered selection for immune system diversity and also considered hotspot activity. Um, and so to say that she does not consider overdominant selection for immune system diversity is obviously a misreading of her. McBride apparently has not considered the similarity across family exons of level two, uh, of exon two alleles and not intron two alleles, which she showed very clearly and which we presented um, and um, he simply doesn't deal with it. And this is how you make an argument. If uh, part of your argument is weak, you simply just leave it out.
She concludes by telling us it seems not unreasonable to propose that HLA-DRB1 diversity is the result of a process that generates specific hypervariability and or gene conversion within exon 2 in order to rapidly generate HLA diversity. The existence of such a process essentially demolishes any population genet genetic arguments about ancestral population sizes. That's, of course, Gager's comment. While this may indeed challenge the population genetics inference drawn from exon 2, it does not demolish the population genetics arguments about ancestral haplotypes and are those based on loci outside of the MHC. Well, of course, she didn't introduce the other ones, so the fact that she didn't argue against them is not terribly surprising. I think somebody should take up that challenge, but in the book, she takes up the major publicized challenge and I, in my opinion, makes a reasonable case that it is not a fatal objection to original Adam and Eve. In my opinion, McBride takes the argument that he's making too far. He does have a point, and that is that Gager brought it down to five and then didn't explain how you got from five to three completely, leaving that to other people thinking for themselves. Um, and if I had been writing it, I probably would have said something about that so that people could s say, well, you know, the four million years is an estimate and maybe one of them is younger than uh, 2.3 million years, or maybe humans are older than <coughs> 2.3 million years, uh, any, either one of which would have satisfied the problem. And of course, if I'm writing as a creationist, I would say, and I think their estimates for change are way off. Certainly, they've been way off in terms of uh, uh, mitochondrial Eve. Gager did reply, and I'll just give a little bit of that reply. She denied that she said that two of the haplotypes are four million years old. She kind of implied it, but she didn't say it specifically. She quotes Bergstrom et al. as follows. The topology, and this is her quoting them, the topology of the phylogenetic tree for intron sequences. Now that's not the exon sequences that we've been discussing, that Ayala used. These are intron sequences now. Indicate that most of the alleles within lineages have been generated after the separation of homo and pan. This means sequence differences among alleles within a lineage corresponds to an average age of 180,000 to 320,000 years range based on the standard error. And um, the standard error may be wider than what they realize, too. Uh, this implies that the vast majority, greater than 90% of the more than 135 contemporary HLA DRB1 uh, alleles have a very recent origin. And again, that 180 to 320 should remind you of the 200,000 for uh, uh, Y-chromosome atom and the 250,000 for uh, mitochondrial Eve. Getting back to McBride, we, have, we may have much to learn about the evolution of MHC diversity, but to reject common descent and postulate an intelligent designer who specially created us from an ancestral couple because of this, is ludicrously at odds with the balance of the evidence. And now you see this famous, you know, overwhelming evidence. Uh, what happens is you take each piece of evidence and you ignore the, the negative evidence and you accentuate the positive. And when you get done, it's not surprising that the weight of evidence is positive. Or vice versa, depending on what you assign negative and positive. It's a good way of persuading yourself that your opponent has no arguments is to take them apart one by one and to keep all your arguments even if they're kind of shaky and then argue that uh, you've got the weight of evidence on your side. And then he has a section called Closing Thoughts on Science and Human Origins. I'm going to skip the first paragraph. Again, we're doing Reader's Digest. If you really want the whole thing, it's available on the internet. I've been left wondering why the Discovery Institute or intelligent design advocates in general or biblical literalists feel a need to try and accommodate science when they have a belief in a supernatural entity 
capable of breaking natural laws. In the case of this book, it has left them needing to make all kinds of awkward criticisms of fields in which the authors clearly lack expertise. Um, a lawyer is not the right guy to challenge the world's paleoanthropologist nor the world's geneticist. Certainly he shouldn't be trying to take them on all at once. It will end with him trying to smear the reputation of scientists rather than engaging with their ideas. Well, the lawyer ha happens to have some training, and I'm going to agree that, um, that sometimes he argues more like a lawyer than a scientist, although I think that a scientist could make some of the same arguments and make them stick. By the end of the book, I was left with a massive, if fairly obvious, incongruence. The reality is that the overwhelming majority of scientists in each of the fields addressed in this book share a broad consensus that is at odds with what the authors claim. Everybody agrees with me. And despite the breathless accusations of a Darwinian conspiracy, well, I don't know, after seeing what happened to the dinosaur bone carbon-14, I'm tempted to say that the, maybe conspiracy is not the right word, but uh, maybe um, a generalized bias would be fair to say. Mm -hmm. um, mainstream scientists are a diverse bunch, like Francis Collins and Francisco Ayala, although I would accept the latter because I'm not sure he doesn't want to be labeled a Christian most recently, um, who are both singled out in this book. Many are themselves Christians, Christian yet accept a balance of evidence for our evolutionary past. Um, they accommodate their beliefs with an uncompromised view of the science. Uh, interesting statement, and I think we'll have some more comment on that kind of statement in uh, couple of weeks um, with the science. This is because they have engaged openly with the evidence of their discipline and conclude that evolutionary principles best explain human origins. There is no atheist conspiracy to force evolution on the public and again I I think that conspiracy is the wrong word. It was no more of a conspiracy than there was a conspiracy to suppress the theories of uh, J. Harlan Brett's, uh, the flood or floods that went through uh, uh, the Pacific Northwest. They just all had the same viewpoint, and it happened to be a viewpoint that was incorrect, but one that they had been trained into. You don't have to have a conspiracy when uh, people all believe the same. <coughs> There's no smoke-filled room with people saying, ah, let's get him here, let's get him there, let's get him somewhere else. They're actually following their own belief system, one that they share with each other. There is no atheist conspiracy to form evo force evolution on the public. Instead, it is all of the diverse and beautiful evidence of the world around us that points to evolution having shaped us and the Earth's biota. So, you see from his point of view, this is just where the evidence leads. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are entirely different worldviews, such as the one taken by certain other religious folk. They choose to place their faith paramount to scientific evidence. Although I don't agree myself, I value the conclusions of science ahead of those of personal revelation, it is still a stronger position than that of intelligent design. Now, I will have to say there are people in the Adventist church and other conservative Christian churches that do take this kind of a view. You know, the Bible says that I believe it and that settles it. And, uh, you know, you can just take your science and put it where the sun don't shine. That's not the way I can do things because I use science all the time. So I have to ask the question, what is good science, what is bad science, and where does evolution fall in that regard? And that's, of course, why most of us are here because we're not trying to trash science. And uh, again, in a couple of weeks, we're going to um, have that uh, discussion 
ID tries to straddle some in-between place where it claims to disprove scientific consensus in a number of different fields and then attributes the lack of a shifting consensus towards ID to bias and brainwashing. But as this book amply demonstrates, the real problem is that ID fails to engage with much of the modern literature in these fields, in those fields. Um, well, I guess you'll have to decide whether the book ampl amply demonstrates that or not. I happen to think that it engages very, very carefully in with the modern literature in those fields. This book also demonstrates ID's difficulty with separating itself from Christianity in practice. And there they're partly right. Intelligent design is much more attractive to Christians than many other people. Uh, although it is attractive to some Jews, uh, probably most Jews, um, certainly some Muslims, and some people who are kind of agnostic. It's even attractive people from Hindu backgrounds. I'm thinking specifically of uh, uh, Wickrama Singh, uh, who uh, along with Hoyle proposed that there had to be intelligent design. Now he didn't make it um, he didn't make it the Christian God, obviously. But he said, this stuff just doesn't happen by itself. Concern over how Christian beliefs have been impacted by science and the role of Christians who accept mainstream are at the fore. Well, they, they are some concerns, partly because many people take Christians who accept evolution and rub them in our faces. Even issues like stem cell research appear, given no context. The thrust of the whole book is to claim human exceptionalism, disprove our common descent with apes, and search for real life Adam and Eve. None of this is part of a secular program to genuinely investigate the world. I just love that last sentence. Because, you see, there are no religious uh, programs to genuinely investigate the world. Religion already has its answers and therefore doesn't try to do any kind of research whatsoever. Well, I uh, happen to disagree with that particular premise. But then I think the final paragraph, if my memory serves me correctly, science and human origins has to be described first and foremost as being anti-evolution rather than pro-intelligent design or pro-science. If it offers solace to those seeking evidence against evolution for their faith, the solace should be as incomplete as the arguments made in the book. Well, the arguments are somewhat incomplete, but uh, there's a major problem with this paragraph. And that is, if you look at it very carefully, it says this is all anti-evolution. And you see, McBride appears to have convinced himself, and in common with many others, this isn't a criticism of McBride, primarily. Uh, you see this all over. That the appearance of design has already been explained away. And once you explain that away, then there's no evidence for uh, intelligent design. And therefore, all the arguments are just negatively shooting uh, evolution down. And what is forgotten in that whole process is that the appearance of design is, in fact, prima facie evidence. And maybe it can be explained away, maybe it cannot. But if it can't be explained away, then it's positive e evidence. If you see something and it looks like it's designed, let's say you see a barn and you see an arrow and it happens to be in the middle of concentric circles on the side of the barn. Your first temptation might be to say, it looks like somebody is a very good shot. Now, it's very possible that somebody isn't really a very good shot. It's possible that somebody shot an arrow into the barn and then went out and painted circles around the arrow. 
But of course, that's still intelligent design. What's hard to believe is that the arrow happened to hit the barn, and it just happened to hit it where there were circles around it. That it looks like there was some kind of intentionality somewhere there. Um, could you explain it? Well, if you could explain that maybe there was a um, some kind of rope that got stuck on the arrow and it had paint on it and it somehow went around in a circle and then some more uh, rope of a different size painted another circle and this is all done by you know a wind power or something. Yeah, but I'd like to have evidence for that. That's not my first choice for explaining why the arrow is found in the middle of a target. As I read chapter five, and this is my own opinion, uh, it seemed to argue that the, this is the real chapter five, the one that uh, Engager did, not McBride's criticism. The, my interpretation of her argument was that the challenge to the idea of Adam and Eve came from population genetics with several unexamined assumptions. When the assumptions are examined, in fact, they can be shown not to fit at least some of the data in, from genetic studies. And more reasonable assumptions are much more compatible with two original ancestors. And they picked the study that was first and uh, the one that's used the most. I think McBride pounds the idea of five haplotypes not being able to fit into two people. I would like to know how many changes there are between the five haplotypes. Could it be originally four? Because once it reduces to four, it is obvious that you can put it into two people. Could one or more of them have evolved from one of the others? And if so, how long? And how do you know how long ago they evolved? And finally, how do you know how long ago humans were around? I think Gager does have a point in that the fall of one paper's probative force and the vast reduction of difficulties for the original couple hypothesis makes it premature, at least, to discard that hypothesis. I, I think in the future, somebody needs to go over the whole question looking at, um, if not a comprehensive, certainly a representative sample of the literature that's out there. I think that it is entirely possible that when those assumptions behind each one of the papers are examined, that we'll find that, in fact, they don't uh, prove what people think they prove. Because the, they share assumptions which may very well be faulty. And if, they, if enough of them share those assumptions, then at some point, somebody who's going to make the argument should have to defend a specific paper in a very strong way, rather than just simply wave papers at us and say, expect this to fall over. I think McBride talked past the main points of the first two chapters, which is really sad. I wish that he'd paid more attention to those points, at least uh, the ones that I pulled out. His rescue position that evolution would have been happy with any target, and it just happened that the target it hit was humans, or biotin precursor producing enzyme, I think is really reaching. It is improbable, number one. Number two, there's no current evidence for it. And in my opinion, if the real arguments from contemporary evolutionary biology literature don't deal with the problem outlined by Gager and Axe, then the contemporary literature is not dealing with serious, possibly fatal problems for neo-Darwinism. And the contemporary literature needs to be updated to actually make that, uh, make the connection and then either destroy it or accept it. Mm. I think that, this, that his criticism of chapter five is not sufficiently sensitive to the possibility that the current consensus may be wrong because of faulty presuppositions. But with that, I'm going to invite your comments and questions. And um, we have 10 minutes before the official uh, end of the uh, class, although obviously those who want to stay can ask questions afterwards. Comments? 
Well, I, I'd make first this, this general comment about this uh, warfare between creation and evolution or science and the Bible or however you want to label it, um, which, of course, is uh, very much focused in, in this uh, book here. Um, and that is that uh, we need to understand that uh, these scientists who disagree and um, who argue against uh, creation and so on uh, sincerely believe they are right. Uh, and that this is, I think, probably, in my opinion at least, the, uh, an excellent example of what you call self-deception. Uh, by self-deception, we mean that these are not, they're not dishonest in their thinking. They sincerely believe this. They're sure that the majority is right and that they're right and so on. And they keep encouraging each other by uh, arguments, some of which are not very good, as we've seen. And uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, creationists do the same thing at times. We've got examples on both sides here. Uh, the solution is not to keep on uh, doing this. The solution is to get to this hard scientific data, such as this book has done, and show that you know there are alternatives here to uh, the most popular opinion. Uh, ideas come and go. Uh, science prides itself on being able to revise itself, but there's an awful lot of ideas out there that science has not yet revised that it needs to revise. My own, uh, my own personal opinion on this kind of thing is that, is that um, the reason I chose the book is because it doesn't just have arguments, it doesn't just have opinions, it also has some fresh new data that I think haven't been <coughs> sufficiently considered. And, uh, and critique, I think their critique of Ayala's uh, paper was good. Uh, I think it can be improved, uh, but it's, it's a very good starting place to, to, to talk. But more importantly, their, their critique, I think, of, of, uh, mm -hmm. of the entire ability of random mutations and natural selection without some kind of outside help to explain uh, human origins is well, in my opinion, it's a devastating attack. And uh, in fact, uh, I think next week we'll see th a little bit more of those foundations and, and uh, evolutionists have shot themselves in the foot by arguing because by arguing they accept the premise that, uh, that the math is actually accurate when done right. And if you do the math halfway decently, it argues very strongly that this didn't happen on its own by chance. Uh, I would add, uh, McBride makes the comment, and uh, <coughs> I think we can all relate to this logically. Uh, if we uh, don't think very deeply that uh, he doesn't understand, you know, if you have a God who can uh, modify natural law, uh, well, why bother with science? You just say God did it. And I, I think this is a rather simplistic view of God. Uh, certainly does not fit the kind of God that the pioneers of modern science, I'm speaking the last five centuries, uh, thought about, they thought that God had created nature and the laws of nature and the consistency of nature. Uh, it's simplistic, for, I think, for McBride to think that God could not do both, create 
nature and then have nature be consistent. Uh, why, why, uh, why limit reality to such a simple uh, equation? Well, you know, one of the things that's interesting is that uh, as a physician, I expect things to behave more or less the same uh, in various people. Now, not always exactly. Some people are allergic to medicines, other people are not. Some people respond in certain ways and we have to learn to deal with those individualities. Um, and sometimes <coughs> different people will respond to the same medicine in a different way at two different intervals. But if there wasn't some commonality, there would be no point in studying medicine itself. And uh, we do studies on you know, hundreds, sometimes hundreds of thousands of patients trying to find out whether aspirin is a good idea uh, immediately after or during the process of a heart attack or maybe before. Um, and we expect unexamined patients to behave the same as examined patients did. Because otherwise you couldn't generalize from the study to the rest of the population. And so one of the things that you do when you do this kind of thing is you try to make sure that, these, that the population that you're studying is uh, somewhat broad. If you take only males, for example, study may not generalize to females. And that's sometimes been a problem. If you take only adults, study may not generalize to children. Um, and sometimes we have to do the study all over again because the original population was too restricted. Um, but the fact that we do those studies at all <coughs> suggests that we believe that there is some consistency to, if you want to call it that, that there's some natural law. And in fact, much of the time we try to figure out what the mechanism is behind a drug so that we can do tweaking of some kind. Change the drug a little bit, give it at certain times of day, um, give it only to certain people who don't have particular genetic defects, uh, any number of things like that. And we expect our models to actually work. And much of the time when we test them, in fact, they do. And I, this is why I personally can't go with the just, you know, God, I said it and I believe it and that settles it. I can't just throw out, ignore totally science. And I think that McBride actually understands that as do many other people. Um, that that's the reason why the alternative that he gave is not an acceptable one. In fact, I think that there's a little kind of sub-statement that says, sure, you can, as, as long as you're willing to not have televisions, not have cell phones, not have uh, all of the things that science has brought us, that, uh, that you can, you know, if you're going to be a Mennonite or Amish, you know, and you're going to have horse-driven buggies, well, then you don't, then you can kind of ignore scientific advances. And, uh, and the, the Bible says that it was six days, and it implies that it was a few thousand years ago, um, well, then you just kind of you, you accept that and you, you throw out the science. Uh, if you're willing to get rid of all modern science, you can do that. Uh, but for those of us who enter into science-related fields, that's not really a good option. Uh, un unless we want to quit and, and become Amish. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't think that the science is as solidly in his corner as he thinks. We'll come in here. Uh, just a minute. I just made a, I'm sorry. I think you just made a very important point in your comments now, and the same point was made up on the board when you said that logically valid arguments can nevertheless lead to false conclusions or beliefs if they're based upon unsound assumptions or wrong premises. And that there are a number of other premises or assumptions that haven't been examined here and aren't examined in this book that need to be considered. And 
uh, it seems to me that uh, arguments in the first place, I'd made this point once before when I was here, that are drawn from paleontology or from genetics may not really tell us very much about when Homo sapiens sapiens appeared as compared with Homo sapiens. You know, 200,000 years ago, we have Swanscombe man, we have Vertizolo's man, we have Steiner man, and the evidences are that uh, they were Homo sapiens. Uh, 30,000 years ago, you have Cro-Magnon man, and a lot of people assume, scientists, that Cro-Magnon man was identical with modern humans yeah. today. And you will even find people now saying that uh, Homo neanderthalensis is really Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. That's right, and example. you did have sapien, uh, neanderthals apparently coexisting with sapient uh, Homo sapiens uh, and uh, even interbreeding with them according to the genetic evidence. In fact, the genetic ev evidence is broader than that, that uh, Homo sapiens interbred with a number of similar types that were in coexistent at that time. Suggesting that uh, that Homo sapiens actually is... Uh, Got diversity that way rather than through evolutionary breakoffs or forkings. But uh, coming back to an interesting point you made two or three weeks ago with a graph up on the board, it showed that the modern human population has as much diversity in it in terms of cranial size as the uh, evolutionary uh, tree from Homo erectus down to the present that you have among modern Homo sapiens alive today, cranial capacities that range from perhaps near five or 600 cubic centimeters up to perhaps 1,500, which sapien neanderthal. Yeah, all the way up to past 2,000 in some cases. And it has very little, as neurobiologists know, to do with how intelligent the person is. What constitutes intelligence is not the sign of the cranial cavity, it's the number of neurons that you have, the number of synaptic connections they can make with other neurons, and the plasticity of the whole thing during the lifespan in terms of rewiring and refunctioning. And that can take place in very small cavities, and it may fail to take place in very large ones. And uh, I think that it's much more significant to look at artifacts, achievements, than it is to look at these genetic or paleontological evidences of the sort that this book is dealing with. And what you're really looking for is a jump, a gap. When did Homo sapiens become Homo sapiens sapiens? And the evidence is that it was not three or four million years ago. It was much closer. It was someplace probably between about 100 and uh, perhaps uh, 7,000 years ago when ancient Sumer appeared. Yeah. Virtually all the civilizational accomplishments yeah. that we have. That is, of course, assuming this, the uh, standard geologic time scale, which uh, may not be a valid assumption. Um, some of the work that I'm doing kind of suggests that, uh, that stretching time beyond uh, 50,000 years becomes problematic and perhaps even be beyond about 20,000 becomes problematic. Well, what I'm suggesting is if there was an Adam and Eve, they may not have appeared two or three million years ago. That That's exactly right. 30,000 years ago or 50,000 or whenever. And of course, there was this recent claim, you know, that all living humans today are descended from one Eve based on mitochondrial DNA. I have a couple of comments from the other side of the room. Yeah, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about this, uh, more what our friend was saying, about the size of the uh, skeletal and as well as the cranial capacities. Because there seems to me, I mean, having been, for instance, to Zaire, that is the Belgian Congo, and seeing some of the pygmies, I mean, they are really small, but they're not stupid. They certainly have the capacity to adapt and learn and go to school and you know use intellectual powers but at the same time there seems to be especially on the uh, YouTube um, a tremendously entertaining if nothing else 
um, set of uh, videos showing enormous giants. And I think that some of the giants are verifiable in the sense that they're in uh, legitimate museums. But some of the skulls, for instance, are, I mean, you know, they're getting close to 18 inches and so on, even two foot. Have you come across any evidence that that is sustained by the scientific community, or do they really think these are cranks? I mean, this may be Dr. Ariel Roth's uh, field, but <laughs> uh, I'm just curious because there's so much enthusiasm in certain sections about how exciting this is and what does it say. In other words, nearly suggesting that we are midgets compared to some of the giants that were in the past. And if that's the case, it's reverse evolution, if anything else. I would like to see some of those uh, skeletal remains examined carefully um, by people who are willing to be unbiased in either way. Now, that, there aren't very many people like that because there, most people would, would tend to either be biased one way or the other. Uh, and of course, if I were to do it myself, I am sure that uh, many people, especially the people, whoever they were, who disagreed with my conclusions would simply say I'm biased. And that's one of the problems that you get with this. Um, I, mean, I mean, there's lots of problems. I mean, for instance, there's these legends about some of the ancient Vikings being huge people. But the very oldest uh, housing and, uh, for instance, beds that these supposedly giant Vikings used are too small <coughs> for even me to fit in. Well, my understanding is that one of the kings of Sweden was, in fact, seven feet tall. Yeah, I think that's very viable. See, I have, a, <coughs> I have a relative in the Netherlands, at Fries, who are also big people. Sure. Uh, in fact, uh, they're some of the tallest in the world. And he's seven foot. Yeah. And my son lived with him for a while. So, yeah, I mean, uh, we had a relative. But, but we're, talking, we're talking about people who look like they might be more like 10 feet or 12 feet, sure. in, in judging from the skull, which, of course, is a... You know, risky judgment, but not that risky. Um, and, you know, you'd like to see whether those things had, in fact, the kind of inner structure of the bone that precludes them being a, a manufactured artifact, because that would be the one thing I think people would argue about. Um, the other thing is I think people, some people who wouldn't want to accept them would simply ignore those uh, ignore those as part of the evidence, too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and of course, as long as somebody official hasn't looked at them and said, yeah, they're really, they're really there, uh, this is one of the problems that we're having with, uh, uh, with various kinds of compounds found in dinosaur bones. Until Mary Schweitzer found them, People might propose that they had them. People might say they had them. People might say, boy, this smells like it's dead, you know. Uh, in fact, everybody knew in, the, in her area that it smelled like it was dead. Um, somebody else might look in it and say, I think I see white, uh, red blood cells. But it took an official person to be able to say, <coughs> yes, it is, and to elevate it into a scientific uh, controversy. The, the thing is that um, I made a particular effort over the last two months to look up all the evidence about the pyramids, which are now found all over the globe, and how it's kind of comical that in my brother-in-law's home island of Mauritius, the government does not accept they have a pyramid, and yet it's, I mean, he has been climbing it over them as a little boy. So uh, the things are there, and we have them in Bosnia, and we have them, in, as we all know, in Central America and so on. So how does this incredible diversity of human activity fit into the uh, evolutionary scale because they're, they're proposing that this, um, at least as far as I understand, perhaps I'm missing a point here, but they seem to be suggesting that the human uh, breakaway from the chimpanzees occurred all over the place and it occurred many times and yet we know the maths is totally against it happening even once. So uh, is there some explanation that they come across by saying, oh well, you know, there was uh, land bridges all over the place and you know, have you got any comment on that? I mean, it, it seems to me that the evidence from, uh, so we say, <laughs> fairly recent human endeavor, um, it verifies or establishes that humanity was all over the planet 
and it was very sophisticated and it had similarities and you know features mm -hmm. in common with each other <coughs> well anthropologists um, are amazed by this kind of thing in the American Southwest uh, there were people who made multi-story multi um, uh, multi, I guess you call it apartment buildings, Correct. Uh, which at one time were the most, the, were the largest apartment buildings in the world. Um, and it just kind of sprang up out of nowhere. And so what, what anthropologists will tell you is that apparently human ideas, once they get started, can just grow. And that's probably fair. And once you say that, of course, then, then anything that humans do can be uh, described in natural terms, if you want to put it that way. The, the problem with, uh, you know, if there are 18-inch or 24-inch skulls, um, now you're talking about size of actual humans and that has to be done by bio biology because as far as we know, nobody's discovered the right growth hormone to make that happen, uh, let alone imagine that people in premature, you know, uh, pre in prehistorical times uh, had enough brain power to figure out how to make it happen. So it's a, you know, it's a problem, and uh, I mean, it's, uh, for example, Guadalupe woman has been around for decades. What mostly happens is people ignore it. The regular scientific community hasn't picked it up. Um, they say there must be a problem with it, so there must be a problem with it. Um, and you can foreclose a lot of discussion that way. I would just add the. Um, it is uh, rather interesting that uh, it doesn't seem, from from the archaeological evidence and so on, that uh, man, as uh, we understand him, uh, and of course, what, how are you going to define man as a problem, and so on? But if you, even if you're talking about a couple hundred thousand years. Uh, it doesn't look like he's been around here that long doing anything intelligent. I'm speaking of writing. Our writing is just a few thousand years old. Our good, solid evidence of intelligent building, uh, pyramids, uh, aqueducts, just a few thousand years old. What was man doing all the time before that, if he existed before that? And, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, human activity seems, <laughs> seems uh, rather recent. The good evidence of human activity, I mean, you know, they, they're, they're questionable uh, buildings and so on, uh, but they're, they're not impressive to say the least. Uh, the history, our history seems to be fairly recent. Uh, uh, all this, you know, it, uh, it's... Uh, what was happening before that, if man was around? You know, that's an interesting question because if you go back on most histories, they fade out after probably about 4,000 years, maybe 4,200, some, you know, it's, um, uh, Chinese history does that, uh, Mayan history does that. I mean, uh, some of them don't even go back that far. Uh, but, uh, the the one place the one place well Mesopotamia and and Egypt go back further. Um, we've discussed in this class wh whether maybe some of that is uh, is spurious, and if that's the case, it looks like maybe it all went back to about you know four thousand plus or minus years ago. In which case, we may be looking at it. Uh, the rest of this stuff is um, either prehistoric or maybe even some of it is, um, and, and dated improperly, 
and some of it may even be uh, uh, pre-flood. Uh, I am particularly struck by the, you know, the Laetoli footprints that just don't make any sense. Um, and I think that there are probably other artifacts out there that, that simply are being ignored because they don't really fit in. I was reading through somebody else who was commenting on Lubino, and I went back and looked at Lubino, and, it, and indeed there is a there is a elbow joint that looks perfectly good for modern humans. That is in the 4.1 million year range. So, uh, you know, but that one doesn't make the papers. See, if. In science, we generally do not publish, how should I say, negative results unless we actually have a purpose for doing so. Um, if we encounter some problem and we don't know what to do about it, we hope that someday we'll work it out and then we'll publish what the problem was, the history, chronology, and the results of our experiments, and finally the, the conclusions. And that's very understandable because it's, it's uh, all, it's, look, it's, look uh, Thomas Edison didn't say, tell everybody, well, these are all the metals that won't work in a light bulb. Right. That, it wasn't until he got carbon fiber and it actually did work that you started hearing about it. Right. It's, it's, he didn't keep a catalog of everything that didn't work. <laughs> well, he may have, but it was yeah, didn't get published. Have, but we don't. Yes. The, the thing is that this is what, what becomes in the scientific community essentially by default a blind spot because it's out of sight of the community. It's not something that uh, people generally tell other people uh, up front. Well, I don't know what to do with this. And the other guy says, well, I don't know either. Uh, you know, you don't usually have conferences like that. Sometimes when, it when something like that comes out, it comes out over a beer in the pub or something like this, and many times that has been very fruitful because people discovered, oh, so you've encountered a similar problem in a very different context. Maybe there is something there that's worth pursuing. It wasn't just a technical error or, or mere mm -hmm. um, artifact of some sort. Nobody wants to chase artifacts. Well, besides that, if you publish stuff that doesn't make sense, yes. it reflects badly on your laboratory. Well, it does. I mean, you can't it does. do that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> go ahead. No, the, the young lady down here. Time to go to church. I want to go to church. I'll do it next week, maybe. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll give you one comment, and then we'll quit. Well, good morning again. This is my, I'm Vivian Cervantes Gladden. We all have our letters here. PhD in health science. Uh, I was born to this denomination. This is my denominational home. This church is my home for the last 40 years. I came over from White Memorial. Uh, I'm not going to. This gentleman has just taken the thoughts out of my mind here. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. It's wonderful. I'll extend. Uh, where do I start? Uh, let me just back up. The word truth, really, we've heard that from the time we were born. Truth. And I'm not a renegade. Um, I love this, I love the tr this message. I think the only thing that we have to, to be concerned about is that what truth we, only truth we do have is the Sabbath, maybe. We're not uh, observing that as it, because it's clinical, basically, mirrors the heavenly courts, the Sabbath, that seventh day, every cell should have a Sabbath. And the nutritional aspect. I'll be 86 in three weeks, and he's 91. Thank you. Not bragging, 
but just I will no Botox, none of that. And I hope that I've helped. I hope that I've been worthy. We've traveled all over the world, Singapore, the Caribbean. This gentleman at 86 had his birthday, 86th birthday, teaching at Oxford University, and I was a guest speaker. We've all have our accolades. Now, all of this is great, it's wonderful. We're biblically based. When I was, when we first married, 55 years ago, we've been married 55 years. I'm just making a very homely kind of kindergarten thing kind of here where I can just, I can, I'm a lecturer also. I've been, my PhD's coming out of my ear. Mm. But he used to call me Sister White. He used to call me Ellen White. <laughs> Came up from school, <laughs> didn't have anything on. Well, we, as far as I'm concerned, we are embracing a Victorian concept and the biblical doctrine of Ellen White. I have all the testimonies come from a doc doctor, family, physician, and, and, and ministers, and I'm not a, 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 a rebel or anything like that in that sense. But brothers and sisters, as we used to say in the Bible, we don't want to be like these two brilliant gentlemen, Rutherford and Kelvin, said that at the turn of the century, everything had, that needed to be discovered had already been discovered. Am I wrong in that? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Rutherford, Lord Rutherford. And five years later came Einstein, and I'll have to come, say, to come on your shoulders here, piggyback on you, in that you might find some truth which moves on, you never know where you're going to get this. And so let's go to the Bible for just a moment. This is where we're, this is where we're based. Genesis 6, the daughters, the sons of God, went unto the, the daughters of men. Now we go to Genesis uh, 1, Cain and Abel, and Let's just fast forward here. And uh, I'm not talking down to anyone. I'm talking the way I maybe talk to my, I'm a great grandmother of five, five, all right? And I would say this. Genesis, let's make it very simple. I know, I understand all of this. We, we're, uh, but understand what they're saying. Genesis 1, let's go, let's, why don't we go to this book, this great book? Hebrews tells us, world's without end. Go to Genesis where I step, I'm, I'm going back, go, uh, rewind here. It says that Cain and Abel killed his brother. So then, says the Lord, Jehovah Elohim, the Lord God, Jehovah, we go to the Archul and go, go to the Hebrew there, and says that he walked in the garden, this is Genesis 3, and one, they wondered why they were naked. But before that, he tells, he, he says he's going to put him out of the garden. He says, you, I'm going to put you out. Where did he put him? So they told me, I was a little girl, well, he, that, that uh, he married his sister. Come, please. Married his sister? Who was out there? Who was out there? Now, we've all had anthropology, archaeology, paleontology, all of this. But who, which, this is this book. Did we, why did we ever think about going back to this book? Go to this. It's all here. It's absolutely here. And it, we're told, somebody says, about the truth, but we're told, study to show thyself approved. So do we get stuck in, like, that the Inquisition, which we know was political, what they did to Bruno, what they did to people, women like myself who would speak up. They burned us. They burned us at the stake. They, they burned Bruno. Then they put Galileo under house arrest. We wouldn't be here talking about any of this astronomy, archaeology, the, the beauty of, as Shakespeare put it, Lee, why don't you recite that? Oh, I've said enough. You've said enough, I think you had for a moment, yes. <laughs> the beauty 
of man, of us, of humans. We're the greatest artifact, this brain. I could tell you, I think you're a biologist, and you say he's a biologist, among other things. Enjoy your remarks. But what do we, let's look to this, let's look to, to this, the, I don't know how many of you believe in the second coming or the parousia. Parousia, we put that in the, as the, as the, the um, uh, uh, what we we'll say the ministers will call it that, you know, the theologians. But let's look to the future here, the future now. This is beautiful. This is all wonderful. It exercises our brains, exercises our minds, but it's more incredible than we can ever imagine. So let's, uh, we're, 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 we're standing on the threshold of immortality. And so I've skipped around a little bit here, but here, I don't know if you agree with anything I've said. <laughs> and that doesn't really matter to me. I just wanted to express that and more. I can get deeper if you want me to. But that's how, that's how. Let's look to the, to the future now. I mean, what's going with the Kepler mission? 17,000, 17,000, 17 billion as of June, July. Nin uh, this is 2013, in habitable exoplanets in, in our Milky Way. So think, think. This incredible, this incredible artifact we have in brain. I think I'm going to let you have the last word. So. Next week, we will talk about um, the uh, uh, don't pick a fight with Behe. Through a bunch of it's, it's dangerous to engage intelligent design. And then the week after that, uh, Ariel Roth will have uh, something on science and we'll uh, be letting you uh, know more specifics in a bit.